morning, Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Butt in Washington. Today is Thursday, May 18, and here are some of the stories we are covering. The U.S. condemns an attack on its embassy convoy in Nigeria. This convoy was carrying nine Nigerian nationals, five employees of the U.S. mission to Nigeria, and four members of the Nigerian police force. At least four were killed. Nigerian security forces search for attackers of the U.S. embassy convoy. Nigeria's Bayosa state releases a long-awaited report on oil pollution. A rebel group accuses the Ethiopian government of attacks despite peace talks. Cameroon separatists deny some of their fighters have surrendered to the government. The U.N. Secretary General praises the renewal of the Black Sea Grain Initiative. The UNHCR explains the impact of the Sudan conflict on its neighbors. It is estimated that over one million people may leave Sudan in the coming six months. A total of 472 million U.S. dollars is required for the initial six months. And the U.S. charities oppose Ghana chess workshop championing women. Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has condemned Tuesday's attack on a convoy of two U.S. government vehicles from local government Abra State. He said in a statement Wednesday that the U.S. worked closely with Nigerian law enforcement colleagues to bring those responsible to justice. Here is State Department Principal Deputy Spokesperson Verdant Patel. On the afternoon of May 16th, unknown assailants attacked a convoy of two U.S. government-operated vehicles in the Ogbaru local government area of the Anambra state in Nigeria. This convoy was carrying nine Nigerian nationals, five employees of the U.S. mission to Nigeria, and four members of the Nigerian police force. Uh, They were traveling to advance a visit by U.S. mission personnel to a U.S.-funded flood response project in Anambra. Uh, At least four were killed based on the information we have now, and U.S. mission personnel are working urgently with Nigerian security force counterparts to ascertain the location and condition of the other members of the convoy. We condemn in the strongest terms this heinous act, and we will work closely with our Nigerian law enforcement colleagues in seeking to bring those responsible to justice. We express our heartfelt condolences to the families of those killed in the attack and pledge to do everything possible to safely recover those who are unaccounted for. The U.S. reaffirms its commitment to the people of Nigeria to assist in the fight against violence and insecurity. That was State Department Principal Deputy Spokesperson Vedanta Patels speaking in Washington during Wednesday's press briefing. Nigerian and American authorities say they are investigating an armed attack on a U.S. convoy in southeast Anambra State, killing two consulate staff and two policemen. The Nigerian police say the attackers also abducted two police officers and a driver. Nigerian authorities suspect the separatist group, the indigenous people of Biafra, may be behind the attack. Timothy Obiezu reports from Abuja. Anambra State Police Command spokesperson Tochuku Ikenga said Wednesday that security forces are searching for the perpetrators and the three people they abducted. In a separate statement late Tuesday, Ikenga said local police were unaware of the movement of the U.S. convoy until after the attack and that the area was known for separatist violence. Police said the attackers opened fire on the motorcade killed the officers and U.S. consulate workers and then burned their corpses along with the vehicles. Analyst Kabiru Adamu of Beacon Security Consulting says there's no question the attackers sought out the U.S. convoy for attack. These vehicles had diplomatic plate numbers. They were protected by security escort. So it was very clear that whoever targeted them, it was specific targeting. Nigerian police and U.S. national security official John Kirby say there were no U.S. citizens in the convoy. No group has claimed responsibility for the attack, but authorities suspect separatist agitators in the region. Security forces have blamed the indigenous people of Biafra for increasing violence in the southeast, but security expert Chidio Major says the attack is a sign of a general decline in security, not just Biafran separatist activity. It just goes to show that the security challenge in the southeast is, is, is uh, 
is still very much uh, an issue. I, I do not want to believe that every crime committed in the South is now resolved by ESN and IPOF. You see, because there are, there are opportunity crime, criminals who take advantage of this situation and they commit these kind of crimes, the embassy should have known that the Southeast region for now is actually challenged by the security issue. The IPOP is seeking to break away from Nigeria's southeastern region to form an independent state called Biafra. The movement triggered a civil war in the late 1960s in which an estimated one million Biafrans died, mostly from famine. In recent years, the region has seen increased attacks, including many raids on offices of the Independent National Electoral Commission, or INEC, in a bid to disrupt elections. Adamu says the latest attack less than two weeks to the start of a new presidential administration could have implications. The fact that it's in a transition period, the attacker would have known that the consequences of attacking a diplomatic convoy in a transition period would be far-reaching. And so whether the objective is to you know, affect the transition or not, the result is the same, that there are warnings by several security departments in Nigeria that there are plans to truncate the transition process. On Monday, the U.S. State Department announced a visa ban on Nigerian citizens who undermined the electoral process. The department did not immediately name anyone affected by the ban. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. A new report commissioned by Nigeria's Bayosa State, one of the major oil producing states in the country, says $12 billion is needed to clean up decades old oil spills and reverse environmental damage in the Niger Delta region. The report, released by the Bayosa State Oil and Environmental Commission, says international oil companies operating in the region were responsible for much of the pollution from harmful chemicals. One of the authors of the report is Dr. Anna Zalik, a faculty member in the Global Geography, Environmental and Urban Change Program at York University in Toronto, Canada. She talks to viewers Jackson Vunganyi about some of the findings and recommendations in the report. You know, what was particularly shocking was that as a re- the result of the, of the um, groundwater and surface water samples that we took demonstrated access to World Health Organization standards of between 100 and in some cases up to a million times the target value for the maximum amount of a particular PAH, so aromatic hydrocarbon or, or total petroleum hydrocarbon in this region. So, you know, vastly exceeding what are considered healthy quantities in an environment. One of the things that, you know, I think was particularly stark in the lead up to the inauguration of the commission was the publication of a report of an article in in a leading science journal um, that was co-authored by one of the members of the expert working group that demonstrated causality between oil spills and miscarriages in the Niger Delta. And this, this was, you know, while it was something that was sort of assumed to be the case for many who studied the region, um, that is an extremely powerful and disturbing finding that demonstrates Arguably, I mean, a long history of systemic racism in the way the oil and gas industry has operated internationally. Before we get into any positives and maybe some recommendations, I wanted to ask you, how how do we explain the failure to regulate the impact of these oil companies, whether it comes from the the gas flaring, the oil spills, the releasing of uh, toxic contaminants uh, into the water and into the environment? What explains that the states fail to play its, you know, regulatory role? So, you know, much is made of um, internal corruption and regulatory problems within the Nigerian state. Um, And, you know, one would not argue that these are not features of the broader context. But I think what is most significant is that that context has become highly profitable um, for the oil and gas industry because it allows it to reduce its costs of production in the region. So, you know, from a perspective of looking at the systemic causes, it's really corporate criminality um, and profiteering over a context where it doesn't have to pay pay for its pollution that is, you know, at the root of of the problem. What are the recommendations of of the report? How can 
this damage be redressed? So, you know, um, we have a series of recommendations that call for an overhaul in the regulatory system, so point at, at the concerns that, that you just raised, Jackson, but also call for a, a $12 billion remediation fund, and that figure is calculated based on um, an extrapolation from the number of hectares that the United, United Nations Environment Program assumed the amount of funds that would be required to clean up the Agoni region in River State um, in the 2011 report that was produced to by Elsa State. So, um, you know, from the perspective of the requirements of the transnational firms, that is obviously, you know, a significant figure. But the recommendations also call for, you know, independent and consistent monitoring of health impacts for a much improved process of reporting on spills. Dr. Anna Zalik is a faculty member in the Global Geography, Environmental and Urban Change Program at York University in Toronto, Canada. She was speaking with viewers Jackson Vunkanyi. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on The Voice of America. I'm James Butte in Washington. Today is Thursday, May 18. For more Africa news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The United Nations says it needs more than $3 billion for humanitarian aid for refugees in Sudan. At a news conference Wednesday, the head of the U.N. Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, Ramesh Rajasingam, said some of the amount will be used to help about 18 million vulnerable people inside the country. Sudan's army, led by General Abdel Fattah al barham and the Rapid Support Forces paramilitary group, led by General Mohammed Hamdan Daglo, have been fighting each other since April 15. The UNHCR's Assistant High Commissioner for Operations, Raouf Mazou, shared an overview of the Sudan conflict's impact on its neighbors during Wednesday's news conference. 220,000 refugees and returnees have been seeking safety in Chad, South Sudan, Egypt, Central African Republic, and Ethiopia. 150,000 of them are Sudanese refugees and asylum seekers. Close to 60,000 are former refugees in Sudan returning to their countries in adverse condition, the South Sudanese forming the largest number. Overall, it's important to remember that there were more than a million refugees living in Sudan prior to the crisis, and there are also some 10,000 former refugees in Sudan who are moving to a third country. It's important to underline once more the importance of the asylum that is being provided by neighboring countries and thank neighboring countries for keeping their borders open. Following broad consultation with hosting governments and interagency partners, it is estimated that over one million people may leave Sudan in the coming six months. And this includes refugees, returnees, but also migrant returnees and third country nationals, which in coordination with IOM, we have included in the plan. A total of 472 million US dollars is required for the initial six months of the response in support of government hosting refugees in neighboring countries. Raouf Manzou is the UNHCR's Assistant High Commissioner for Operations. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres announced Wednesday that Russia has agreed to continue its participation in the Black Sea Initiative, which allows grain and foodstuffs from the Ukrainian ports to countries around the world. The Secretary General said he was pleased because the renewal means the grain would be used to feed hungry people in Sudan. We have some positive and significant developments. The confirmation by the Russian Federation to continue its participation in the Black Sea Initiative for another 60 days. I welcome this decision. The continuation is good news for the world. Outstanding issues remain, but representatives of Russia, Ukraine, Turkey and the United Nations will keep discussing them. These agreements matter for global food security. Ukrainian and Russian products feed the world. 
Under the Black Sea Initiative, more than 10 million tons of food have been exported. Vital food supplies are reaching some of the world's most vulnerable people and places, including 30,000 tons of wheat that just left Ukraine aboard a WFP chartered ship to feed hungry people in Sudan. They matter because we are still in the throes of a record-breaking cost of living crisis. Looking ahead, we hope that exports of food and fertilizers, including ammonia, from the Russian Federation and Ukraine, will be able to reach global supply chains safely and predictably, as foreseen in both the Black Sea Initiative and the Memorandum of Understanding on Russian Food and Fertilizer Exports. That was UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres speaking Wednesday on Russia's renewal of the Black Sea Green Initiative. Rebels in Ethiopia's Oromia region have accused federal troops of launching attacks despite an agreement stemming from Tanzanian peace talks to de-escalate the conflict. Miami Seeker reports from Addis Ababa. The Oromo Liberation Army, a rebel faction operating out of Ethiopia's Oromia region, says federal government troops launched attacks in the region despite an agreement to, in the words of the OLA, de-escalate. Preliminary talks between the two sides took place earlier this month in Tanzania with no agreement reached. OLA International Spokesperson Oda Tarbi said that the attacks are in contradiction to the understandings reached between the two parties. After the conclusion of the preliminary talks in Tanzania, where we had a mutual understanding that de-escalation must be a priority, the Abi regime unfortunately chose a different path. It launched a comprehensive offensive on all territories under our administration. The fighting has been very intense. The rebel group says federal groups attacked several points in the Oromia region, specifically west and east Walega, east and west Shoa, Arsi, Borana, Hararge, and Horoguduru. It says troops burned homes, robbed people, confiscated mobile phones, and committed acts of sexual violence, among other crimes. VOA reached out to the Oromia region spokesperson and a security advisor to Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed for comment, but has not received any response. Fighting between the OLA and federal troops has gone on for four years and displaced thousands from their homes. Prime Minister Abiy announced that peace talks with the group would begin in April. Since then, both sides have reiterated their commitment to a peaceful resolution, despite not reaching an agreement during the first round of talks. However, the OLA says it will not be pushed to accepting a subpar political settlement through military pressure. Maya Misikert for VOA News, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Cameroon separatists are denying that some of their fighters have surrendered to the government. Cameroon officials told VOA Wednesday that 18 separatist fighters, including two generals, disarmed and surrendered. But Chris Anu, formerly Secretary of State for Communications, who is now calling himself the leader of the legitimate interim government of Ambazonia, says the news is propaganda intended to lure separatist fighters to surrender. He tells me the so-called surrendering separatists are armed robbers. They were not Ambazonian fighters. They were boys who had left the battlefields and uh, indulged in abductions, ransom takings. And uh, your reporter will also tell you if you found out that this particular guy who was picked up had built lots of houses. How does somebody who is a fighter in the bush begin to build houses? Where is he getting the money from? So he had become a nuisance to the community, and they were hunting for him. And all he needed to do is surrender to La Republic to Cameroon. They are not restoration fighters. They were robbers, highway robbers, actually exporting timber to Nigeria, neighboring Nigeria. And they did that a lot, and that's where they got money to build homes. So what you see out there is propaganda from the Cameroon government. They are trying to lure our fighters to do the same, surrender. So, Chris, I listened to your message to your people about May 20. Tell us uh, what's the significance of May 20 and what are you planning on doing? May 20, 1972 was the day that the French Cameroon government conducted a fraudulent referendum in which you could only vote yes for the Southern Cameroons to join with French Cameroon. After they did that, it became a National Day celebration every month. And the one Southern Cameroonians to go out and celebrate the day, they were colonized and annexed by French Cameroon. So six years ago, we banned the celebration of 20th May 
in our territory. And so this time, we have declared a total lockdown of the southern Cameroon beginning Thursday through Saturday. We are sending a message to La Republique du Cameroon. We are no longer part of them. You have been speaking about a referendum in Ambazonia, as you call it. What are the terms of this referendum? Who is going to be involved in a referendum in southern Cameroon? James, we are believing that the international community, the United Nations in general, will come into the middle of this conflict and say to Cameroon, hey, if you believe that the English-speaking part of that territory still belongs to you, why not give the people the opportunity to vote for it? That is all we are asking for. We want the people of the Southern Cameroons to go to the polling stations, vote as to whether they want their own independent country or they want to stay in one and indivisible Cameroon. So, James, we are saying by a referendum, Cameroon can then test that narrative. A referendum is the easiest, the simplest, the cheapest means of resolving these seven years conflict. That was Chris Anu, the self-proclaimed leader of the legitimate interim government of Ambazonia. He was speaking with us from the U.S. city of Houston in Texas. The U.S. aid group, The Gift of Chess, has set up a workshop in Ghana producing chess pieces for women empowerment and youth development. The group is using chess to create jobs and strengthen communities through the game. In the Kachile reports from Accra, Ghana. Evelyn Upeta earns about $100 per month making chess pieces at a workshop in Ghana's capital using 3D modeling and a printing machine. The workshop funded by the New York-based aid group The Gift of Chess and operated by local group Clean Freak 64 hires and trains young women like Nupeta. Chess has really helped me. At first, I don't know how to type. Now I'm learning how to type. And at first, I don't know how to use a 3D printer. Now I know how to use it. And now I can produce a, ch- a chess piece. And I'm very sure this will help me in the near future. The popularity of the strategic thinking game as a tool for community development is growing in Africa. The Gift of Chess sponsors tournaments and has donated a thousand chess sets to underprivileged youth programs in Ghana, Kenya and Uganda and more than 2,500 to Nigeria. Since starting local production this year in Ghana, the team has sent more than 50 chess sets to schools and youth centers and taught scores of young women how to play. Philippa Meiko is the president of the Ghana Chess Association. I think this particular program is going to go a long way to support the girls to think outside the box. And as you know, chess is a thinking game. So as they engage in chess, they, they're able to you know, uh, uh, widen their, their scope, their thinking scope. And uh, I think it's going to have a long way, a, a great impact, you know, on their you know, upbringing and then their social background. The workshop also teaches young women computer skills and programming for production. Charles Tando is the gift of chess representative in Ghana. We owe it as part of our corporate social responsibility to develop the communities we find ourselves in. And in, in every community that we go to, we will be concerned about the well-being of the people we train. Some of the people live in very difficult circumstances. So we just don't teach them how to play chess. We teach them a lot of other life skills to help them build their confidence, prepare them for life. As the popularity of chess grows, the aid group hopes to get enough support to expand production in coming months. Nekachile, for VOA News.